All right, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the uh, joint session between Navigating and uh, PLD. We're really excited to once again have some guy that uh, that has not spoken at all today at all. Uh, but we're excited to have both Mike uh, Apter and Dan Rundy. Um, you know, great people, but also just speaking about something that is really near and dear to all of our hearts in that it's actually not just resident. We talk about burnout within the residencies, residents, but it's also we have to address burnout within the residency faculty as well. So without further ado, I give you Dan and Mike. Okay, so uh, it's certainly a privilege to be here. We thank uh, you for the invitation. And uh, this is going to be a really important topic uh, that we'll discuss now, right? So I'm going to do a part, and then Dan's going to take over, and then we'll flip back uh, towards the end. And uh, if you can hold the questions until the end, we'd appreciate it. But uh, let's get started. So I want to know if this is you. And you can raise your hand as I'm going through this, but I'm going to walk you through. Yes, we already have someone already. Perfect. Uh, so let me see. Is this you? So April 6, 2017, so this is not a made-up story. Your APD comes to you and tells you, well, you know, I think I really want to take that quality improvement patient safety position within the department. And I'm going to step down as soon as you find a replacement. So I know you're thinking, well, people make a lot of career moves. This is really not too big of a deal. So I don't really feel bad for Mike right now. But one week earlier, you're informed by the RRC that your program is having its site visit this year during the APD transition. And you just got one of those nifty AFIs, used to be citation, now maybe it sounds not as aggressive, but it still sucks, about research in the program. Do you feel bad yet? No, I don't think so. But then you realize, wow, multiple national lectures due in one week from now. And then I'm going to be court president. So my then reaction becomes, what the fuck just happened? <laughs> right? On April 5th, I was fine. And April 6th, I'm in this situation. How did that happen? So let me ask you if this is you. Whenever date, your PD or chair comes to you and says, you know what, I want you to take over this new curriculum task force that we have and committee. And I want a completed project in one month. So you say to yourself, wow, this is wonderful. Curriculum development, that's like my niche area. So are you going to say no? Certainly not. You're going to say yes. Well, you realize, well, you're already on the triple C, and you got a manuscript due this month, and you're sitting here in the audience at Court AA. So you decide, you know what, I'm just going to plow forward like we normally do, nose to the grindstone, and your first meeting obviously runs late, and you receive a text that, you know, tonight was your kid's recital, and you come home to this. Not my child, by the way, but still really sad. So... How many of us have had similar situations come up like this, right? I think a lot of us. So what are we going to do? Here are some of the objectives. We'll understand the underpinnings. Identify both burnout in yourself. We'll look at the national survey that went out, that Dan put out, with regards to where we are as a specialty, specifically educators, uh, on a burnout assessment. And then I think what you're really here for, which is to understand, hey, what can I do in my own shop? And um, all you have to realize, so for any of you who are not national speakers at CORD yet, you only have to do one thing. You have to make a ton of mistakes in the 11 years that you've been a program director. Then you have to be willing to put it in a PowerPoint presentation and talk about it. Here it is. So that's it. Now, what puts us at risk? And I won't speak to anything clinically because the point of the conference is to put is to understand well, what puts us at risk from an educator standpoint? Well, first of all, we're really achievement-oriented. You really wouldn't be where you are today if you weren't. So you want high levels of achievement. And if you think about the up-and-coming generation, some of whom are in the room, 
whatever we're up to, Y, Z, or something beyond that, you are incredible gamers. Like, I grew up on Atari. I know that's like really embarrassing, but nevertheless, thank you. High five, Todd. Yes. Atari is coming back. So, yeah, it is actually. They're selling limited editions. I already have signed up for one. So, so, and the joystick. That's correct, Todd. Wonderful. So, the thing is, is this achievement oriented nature, what does it instill in us? We want to win. Right? And winning usually comes with some type of attachment to it. Next, this is Rosie the Riveter. Tough times don't last, tough people do. So do you shy away from support being given to you? Okay? Because you feel, you know what? I've got to do this alone. Next, are you this person? I certainly am. It's like, oh, you know, here's what I have to do for the residency program. Yeah, I'm looking through it. I'm like, yeah, this is me. And I can do this too. And I can do this as well. And you fail to actually outreach to your group and delegate. Okay? It's a massive, massive thing that can certainly tip the scales. For all of you introverts in the room, you tend to tackle things by yourself, right? And really don't share a lot of experiences with others like the extrovert would. The extrovert is kind of somewhat uh, guarded from burnout um, in one uh, way, but the introvert actually can tip the scale more towards it. So these are all what I deem tip risks. So let me try an exercise, non-planned, and see if it works. And if it doesn't, I'll tell you why it was so bad. So I want to know how you would identify yourself in five seconds if I was to come up and say hello to you. You're looking at me. This is a wonderful moment together. Hi, my name is Mike Hepter. Okay, so how would you identify yourself to me? Nashville? Oh, here, here. Just so the people in the back don't yell at me. I'm from Nashville, Tennessee. I uh, am the mother of three children. I am the program director at Vanderbilt. And I'm so happy to be here. Awesome. <laughs> that was well done. So, first... Thank you, first and foremost, for screwing my whole point. So, which is, <laughs> but no, you actually did this well, right? How did she identify herself? She identified herself first as a mother of three. Um, thank you. Well, thank you for admitting that, at least. But she identified herself as a mother of three first, rather than, oh, I'm a program director, I'm a faculty member, etc. Now, this is the issue of, has it become so intertwined that your professional life equals your personal identity? Okay? And you have to is certainly try to ensure that that doesn't become what people begin to know you as. Great program director, great faculty member, etc. So what are some other barriers to wellness? Well, first and foremost, there are two things in life that you shouldn't do. A, in terms of being spread thin. You should never spread peanut butter thin. And then secondly, you shouldn't spread yourself thin. And why? Because when you do, you will never have the same workflow output as if you weren't spread as thin. So think about that. And then some of the opportunities ahead, we'll talk about later in like solutions to this, you have to be willing to say no. And that's really tough, especially for the younger people in the crowd, because you're trying to work your way up the line. Do you have asymmetrical relationships within your department and with your faculty? You're the giver, but you're not the receiver, okay? And if that's your personality, that certainly puts you in a little bit of a barrier. And then, when's the last time one of your residents came up to you and said, hey, Todd, you're doing a great job as my program director? That would actually cause me to syncopize, <laughs> if anyone said that. So it just doesn't happen, right? So, then, in some places, there may be this issue of, like, harassment that's going on, which is a terrible thing, discrimination, uh, within your department. But here's what one of the two or three things I love the most. I am classified as the bad guy within my program. And certainly, when you reach the totem pole of leadership, you become that by default. I tell people, and there's people here now, you know, which is wonderful, because, I don't know, 
one sign it's like, oh, wow, I'm really getting old. But nevertheless, they say, you know, what's your best advice for me as a young faculty member? I said, stay as APD. Don't ever become a program director. Why? This is obvious for people. They get to do everything cool. Oh, you want design curriculum? Yes. You want to be in charge of the residents for their wellness? Yes. Then what happens? Oh, you know, Dr. So-and-so, I really don't like the way the program's functioning. Oh, you have to talk to Dr. Epter. I don't deal with any of that. <laughs> right? Yes, more on my plate. So, and then the you versus our concept. So, this happens. Hey, you know, can I talk to you in the hallway? Sure you can. Meanwhile, I'm trying to have a nice day. A faculty member comes over and says, you're a resident. And I just need to stop there in the conversation and be like, hit stop, because anything after this is going to suck. <laughs> and this happens at home, because obviously, I'm a great parent. And I say, you know, your child versus R, right? So this is the thing here. If it's R, it's like, you know, our resident's doing great, you know, clinically now. But then next week, it's your resident if it's a problem. So you inherit a lot of these things, right? So we'll talk about faculty channeling negativity later. And then the requirements have just become quite daunting uh, in terms of the application process. That's going on, the number of applications we receive, the moving goalposts uh, that the ACGME has. So there's just so many things that I think we're dealing with. So I will tell you, it's quite ironic that really the person who's likely to be the faculty member who's burned out in your program is your best faculty member. So one of the things that you can do a tremendous service for is ensure that you identify that person in your program. And it may be you. So I'm going to turn it over to Dan now, and he's going to talk about the national survey that we did. Okay. Is this coming through okay? All right. So this is actually uh, nice for me. So uh, I'm guessing most people in the audience are going to be less familiar with me than with Mike. My name is Dan Rundy. I'm an assistant program director at the University of Iowa. Uh, so thank you for listening. Uh, this was kind of great. Uh, when we started putting this talk together with Mike, he said, you got four jobs. Look good, present the survey data, look good, and safety. And so I think three of the four we should be solid on, we'll see how the data presentation goes. But uh, So anyway, so this is the question, uh, is sort of uh, how burnt out are we as a specialty? Uh, and you know, do we have reason to be worried about that? Uh, and we'll talk about the instrument we used. Thank you to everybody who participated. We had a uh, pretty decent turnout, as we'll see. Um, so uh, this is just, maybe people have seen this or not. This came out, uh, it comes out yearly, uh, 2016, 2017. Uh, Medscape does a survey of 17,000 physicians across the country. Uh, and they asked them some questions uh, about how burnt out they are. And so uh, good news for emergency medicine. Uh, uh, we are, uh, this is the 2016 data. Uh, so we're 50, we were 52% getting beat out by critical care is the most burnt out specialty. Uh, happy to announce hot off the presses this year in 2017. We are number one. So you did it. Good job, guys. Like, uh, uh, we are at a 59% uh, burnout rate. So uh, coming in just under two thirds. Uh, with a six, uh, six or seven percent jump from the previous year, uh, and this is all in the setting of a trajectory of uh, five or six years ago. Overall burnout rates were about forty percent, so now nationally they're up over fifty. So this is a real thing, and it's a real problem uh, for our specialty, kind of globally. So uh, this would be the question. I know I kind of gave it away, but uh, where do you think we are on the toast scale? Are we at that nice piece of untoasted bread, or are we closer over to the corner where it's dark and? Crispy and only the weird people like that. My daughter is one of them. I have grave concerns for her future development. I don't know what that says about her as a person or me as a parent. So um, we use the Mosslack burnout inventory. Uh, people that are uh, familiar with burnout research, this is one of the most widely uh, used. Uh, that typo is, is killing me on the inside. So for all you type A people out there that are judging me, I'm also judging myself. So it's okay. Uh, uh, there is, uh, within the Moslech Burnout Inventory, there is a, uh, an inventory specifically designed for educators. And so we're looking at this, as, as Mike said before, we're looking at this uh, through the lens of education uh, and not uh, maybe just as, you know, when we're in the pit working in the emergency department. And that could have uh, potentially some impact on the results that I'm going to show. Um, it examines, I said as before, these three key in 
the two key areas, this was the response rate we had from the group. So uh, pretty happy about this. 265 people took time out of their day to respond to this. We had a good number of APDs and even larger number of, uh, uh, sorry, large number of PDs, larger number of APDs, uh, some clerkship directors out there. Thank you for taking the time. And then just people who fell into the blanket category of academic faculty. So nice turnout. Uh, in terms of uh, sort of time in the job, that big orange bar is the newbies. So people that were there, uh, one through five years that comprised uh, just under 40% of our respondents. Uh, and that makes sense, uh, sort of given the distribution of how things work. Uh, and then uh, moving up the chain, uh, it's still pretty impressive. Little, about 10% of people who responded to the survey uh, have been working in emergency medicine academically for over 20 years. Uh, so I think that says uh, something good about our specialty, A, that we have been around long enough now to have that be true, uh, and that uh, there's this core group of uh, educators that have experience and are still involved and are able to evidently use email and computers and the internet. Uh, so that lifelong learning thing, evidently not a myth. Congratulations, senior educators. So the first component of the, the MBI is the emotional exhaustion score. Uh, this is one I think we can probably all identify a little bit with. And one word about the way that the MBI works, it's on a continuum, so the points sort of add up. Uh, and as you uh, cross a threshold, you'll go from low to moderate to high. That's how the survey is broken down. Uh, but within that, it's not rigid, so you can be on the high end of one very close to another, uh, you know, going from low to high or low to, low to moderate, moderate to high. Uh, we are squarely in the middle, though, of moderately emotionally exhausted. Uh, and we did not see any variation among the different subgroups uh, in terms of clinical experience. So it doesn't look like the new people are any more burnt out than the people who have been doing it for 10 years or the people who have been doing it for 20 years. So that's good. The next component is depersonalization. Uh, and... The educator survey, for those of you that took it, is framed, this is all framed in terms of uh, working with our learners and with our residents, with our medical students, uh, not necessarily working with patients. So uh, the good news is we were low here. So uh, we were low level of depersonalization uh, for interacting with our residents, which is what we would hope. Now, we are right at the border, so uh, our weighted average was about an eight and a half, uh, which means we were getting close uh, to sort of that moderate level. So even though the overall category looks good. It's one of those things we have to be aware of that we're sort of creeping in there uh, right in sort of this next zone of, you know, maybe not having that connection with the people that we're working with the way that we would hope. And then this one is nice, and I think this one maybe explains why the other two uh, numbers are not as bad as we would have expected. So personal accomplishments of scale. So this is one where you want to have a high score. The other two, obviously, uh, high score is bad. This one, high score is good. So uh, we have a moderate level of personal accomplishment as a specialty. Again, uh, no significant variation across most of the subgroups, and we're at the high end of the scale. So we're, you know, another point, give or take, and we'd sort of be in the high category for personal accomplishment, uh, which I think is good. You know, there's, uh, I don't know where I've heard this somewhere. It's, I think, an obscure podcast. They talk about what we do matters. Uh, and I think that this shows that this is true, and I think maybe doubly so for people in education, for all of the uh, attendant difficulties that Mike has touched on. Uh, you know, maybe there's a sense of that we're actually uh, having some impact. But I think that's also why this is so important to look at, because uh, there's a lot of focus, and rightly so, on resident burnout and preventing it. Uh, but you can't really uh, you can't really remove the speck from your learner's eye until you get the plank out of your own. So I think trying to understand where we are as a group uh, is really important. Uh, this is interesting, too. Uh, it's better to be that senior educator group that I spoke about. Uh, I don't know if it's just natural selection and the, the other people just didn't make it in the field and are now like selling ice cream somewhere uh, in the Arizona desert. Uh, but the the older group actually uh, had the highest level of personal accomplishments, so they were squarely in the high category, the lowest level of emotional exhaustion, uh, and the lowest level of uh, depersonalization, uh, just enough to flip categories uh, in the personal accomplishment area. But it's one of those things that's good to know. So we've talked a lot about this through experience. The other lens that we did the survey through was... Uh, annual census. I think the idea of the number of patients we see impacting us is important. So for those of you that are my age or a little older, uh, this is a famous uh, scene, and this is Spinal Tap, and they're talking about how their amplifiers go up to 11 as opposed to 10. Uh, and that's one of the things in the emergency department is that we don't ever get to say we're full. We don't ever get to say we're maxed out. Uh, the door always stays open. There's room for that next ambulance, that next helicopter, that next person coming through the door. Uh, and that obviously is going to have some potential impact on the way that we approach our job and our overall level of burnout. Uh, we are a busy specialty, so uh, 
a little over a third of the respondents are at institutions that see over 100,000 a year. We didn't uh, subdivide it, so for those of you that are like at the 200K mark, uh, good for you. Uh, we're glad that you exist. Uh, but overall, uh, we're a busy specialty, and I think that's what this shows. I got to admit, before I thought about it, when we sent the survey out, I expected uh, to see maybe a difference here, uh, the idea that when places get busier, when resources get more limited, that we would see uh, burnout being a little bit higher. And actually, we didn't. So burnout levels were the same across all the subgroups, which uh, I think is uh, maybe a testament to the groups that we work in, uh, follow the same trends as the general survey results. So uh, this one I did think was kind of interesting. So I said overall, no big differences. And again, these are small but statistically secret variations. The lowest level census did have a slightly more burnt out answer on two questions. So I feel like I'm at the end of my rope. That green bar is the lower census group, uh, and they were deviated a little bit from the overall group. And then uh, working with people directly puts too much stress on me. So these were two areas. Again, they didn't affect the overall survey results, but I thought this was interesting. I don't know if, if you're at a smaller institution, if that really annoying guy, because there's just less people, he has an outsized impact on how much you want to go to work every day. Uh, so I'm gonna, we're going to maybe investigate that in a uh, further survey if you work with somebody really annoying at a small place. Uh, how does volume impact uh, their impact on your lifestyle? So um, uh, this is where that slide was just talking about how the more experienced educators had uh, actually sort of an overall uh, higher sense of achievement, lower sense of depersonalization, lower sense of emotional exhaustion. Uh, so that can be encouraging for everybody in this group uh, who is uh, starting out that if you can get through it, uh, maybe there's a little bit of light at the end of the tunnel. So in summary, how crispy are we? We're not doing too bad, but we're not great. We're squarely, moderately emotionally exhausted. We are uh, low on depersonalization, but very close to sort of that creeping into that mid-level. And we are uh, high on personal achievement, moderate to almost high on personal achievement. So uh, hopefully that's equally true of everybody in this group. And uh, with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Mike. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. Okay, I'm going to skip through something for a moment and start here. So in terms of time management, um, I actually think this is an oxymoron because you don't manage time, okay? Um, so, you know, there's this kind of scales between, well, am I completing my test, uh, but at the same time, do I have some type of balance, uh, however you define balance, in your life? So to me, what you really have to focus in on is not necessarily time management, but prioritization, okay? That's much more important. And I think this is a great quote. This is from the uh, How to Act Like a Chief Executive uh, in CEO Logic. Prioritizing is the answer to time management problems, not what we traditionally search for on the Internet. And then the most important line here is you need to spend more time on the right things. And if I can get you to do that at the end of the talk, I think we've achieved something towards moving you forward. So on this, you know, here's a, kind of my seven-legged uh, scale uh, or, you know, seven dimensions, if you will, of if I have these things in somewhat sort of balance in these categories, spiritual, family, health, intellectual, financial, career, social, things are going to be okay. What do you think we on this list don't value, uh, we value the least? What do we value the least of all of these things? Traditionally. Health. Outstanding. Health. So isn't that interesting, right? Because you, when you be, will value this is actually when you do not have it, right? So I think this goes back to the old oxygen mask uh, scenario that all of you took airplanes down here have to realize when they talk about you have to make yourself the priority first in order to be good for your patients, your family, your friends, and anyone else. So really, I would start here and pay a little bit more attention to your own self first. Next, what then becomes the second casualty after health? Typically. Yes, sir, Mike. Yes, Mike is, is absolutely correct. Family. How many of you, so remember, what is going to suffer first? Your professional relationships or your interpersonal ones? It's interpersonal ones. When things begin to kick up, you will guard your professional scenario for a multitude of reasons. So how many of you, yeah, and if you can just think quickly to yourself, and I'm not going to ask uh, for any response, but how many of you 
in silence can say, you know what, I know someone who has an awful family life, but they have a great professional life. Probably not, right? So you can look for other jobs in different cities, and they exist all across emergency medicine, but you can't look for other family or children. So really think about that, right? Hopefully not. Um, uh, that was much better in the hotel room when I was practicing. <laughs> so, and then for the, I mean, I've never been there, done that with divorce, but typically, bad for the soul, bad for the wallet, right? So think about this in terms of prioritization for yourself first, your family next. So this is all of the things that I say that what I would refer to as fool's paradise, okay? I tell myself very frequently, even now, well, just till I get over the hump. Or this, you know, this is only going to be temporary. Like I say, oh, you know, this court presidency thing is one year, then I'm done. That's bullshit, you know? And there's so much to be done, right, for the organization, for you. But I'm always replacing something with something that's being subtracted out. So it's like, you know what? I did my lectures, and now I don't have to worry about that. But then there's something else that's going to come up. So don't live in this fool's paradise. You have to make permanent change in order to really get past this. So definitely share uh, things with your program coordinator, because that means you can work in parallel together, but they don't necessarily have to be interrupting you, right? and asking you for certain things because you've already shared what you're doing. So shared calendars, shared lists, etc. whatever you do, I think that's very beneficial. And then certainly share these things with your family. Dan's going to talk about a great uh, platform that he uses that allows him to kind of uh, balance both work and family uh, obligations. So some of you will look towards these matrix, and if you do, that's great um, to help you stratify some of your things. But again, prioritization is the key. So this is one from Habits of Highly Effective People. Do it now, plan it, drop it, or delegate it, depending upon what box things end up in. So I'm not advocating you use this, but this is my contorted sense, a window into what my strange mind as to what I do. So this is a, a continual Google Sheet that I make for myself. And... The way to make this is basically to list everything that is important or task that you have to do on a preliminary list. So that list may be 30 things long, okay? Then, after you've listed all of those things, and don't list them in terms of priority level, just list them. Assign them a letter. A, and I'm going to use kind of our triage system in the department for this, A is like coveted emergent, okay? So as you see for me, Family time hits A, okay? B is like urgent. I have to do it, but it's certainly not something I need to do today. C is kind of like somewhat parking lot items that I will ultimately get to, but certainly don't rise to the level of an A or a B. So then assign A or B or C to everything in, on your list, and then go back and then take all the A's and put a one, two, three, four, or five next to them, however many there are. So now you prioritize everything because what are you going to do? You're going to tackle A1, A2, A3, and once you've canceled those out, things will move from right to left across the uh, bar line here. So I actually have one for my personal life, one for work, which is the second one, and the second is for uh, the third one is for cord. I can't keep them all on the same platform, but it's something to at least think about. It's one slide. Okay, so uh, I just think it's, uh, if anybody was paying attention to the last slide, uh, two things of note there. One was, uh, if any of you uh, saw the note that said, Book Mom's Flight, uh, that's really sweet. What you don't know is that it's, he, she was booking it to Siberia. And then in that bottom left corner, there was uh, uh, Assume Control of Court and Bezel Funds Retire to Bahamas. Uh, that's currently a cue, but I think as he gets closer to his retirement date, that's going to bump up. So uh, it's important what we put on there. Um, this is just my, I, I have literally zero ties for this particular company, but uh, we just actually had uh, 
our faculty retreat, and we had somebody come speak at wellness, and they talked about finding mini moments and things in your days to help with burnout, uh, and like little bits of meditation, and I, I don't know about you, I'm never gonna be that guy, and if, it, if I did, I'd end up like, you know, they'd find me like humming in a closet somewhere uh, in the residency offices, and I would end up on our inpatient psych ward. Uh, so that's not gonna be an effective strategy on my end. So one of the things that I do try to use is technology, uh, and uh, for everybody, I, I have a young family, couple of kids, um, but even with that, life feels very, very busy, and so trying to balance uh, personal life and work life is hard. Uh, many of you probably are familiar with Microsoft Outlook, and that sort of seems to be the, the venue and the format where a lot of our sort of work scheduling and work transactions come into play. Uh, Google Calendar is what I ended up using in my social life and to work with my wife and everything else, uh, and I found trying to go back and forth between the two was not working for me. I was not organized enough, uh, and so it turns out somebody's come up with a solution. It's a program. I think it's 19 or $30 a year or something like that, and it will actually uh, make those two programs talk to each other so that anything you put into your Google Calendar will pop up on your Outlook Calendar and vice versa. Uh, and uh, because of this, I've had way less kids getting stranded at, uh, you know, uh, swim meets and recitals, and I'm missing only like half my clinical shifts now, so it's been a huge just ramp up in productivity for me. Uh, it's really nice. It works really well. Uh, I would advise uh, the one caveat is if you're an intensely personal person, this might not work well for you because stuff you put on your Google Calendar is going to uh, pop up on your Outlook Calendar. So if you have, like, special time smiley face mark on your personal calendar, your work <laughs> colleagues are going to notice that uh, if anybody's paying attention. So that's the one caveat. But I will say uh, this has, you know, it's sort of this keep it simple stupid. I will say of money that I've spent this year, uh, besides for what I'm going to spend at the bar after this talk, this will be its the best money by far because it really just keeps both of those pieces of my life uh, in sync and works really well. So. so a quick word about email as uh, we kind of roll through some of the last things. Um, you know, obviously with devices these days, we're available essentially 24 hours a day, uh, seven days a week. And um, technology is definitely certainly caused, uh, I, I think, some negativity for me in terms of home life. So I think you have to set expectations. And if you're able to try this at least once, that I'm only going to answer email twice a day. Uh, why? Because once you answer an email within five or ten minutes, the expectation is that you are going to answer all of your emails in five to ten minutes. So I would really try to boil it down to one big hit in the morning and one big hit before you go home. And then when you're home, it's over. Uh, because if you carry work into home, that's when things begin to break down. And people, you know, you have to, you've got to live in the moment, right? And be mindful of what's meaningful. And that email at 7 o'clock when it's time to sit down to eat is not meaningful. Okay? So try a twice a day platform. Do I do this? Hell no. But nevertheless, <laughs> that's the point. Don't be me. Now, here's something that maybe you can use within your program. How many of you use Trello or Zen Hub? So not too many hands, uh, which is great, because then it's at least something that you can think about. So, um, you know, instead of always having to talk one-on-one -on -one with faculty members, hey, how are we doing on quality improvement patient safety uh, stuff or healthcare delivery projects for the residents or their research projects. Well, all you have to do is have uh, one of your more techie faculty members uh, form a Trello board and it will show everything that's happening within, in our, in our case, there's every healthcare delivery project, even idea or one that started within our program, who is on it. So you see the teams that are working on that and then what status they're at. And it is fantastic. So I don't have to worry, hey, I wonder if that resident is doing a healthcare delivery project. I wonder if they're going to do a research project. With Zen Hub, the only major difference is that you can actually assign people tasks and timelines to complete something in Zen Hub. So that's the difference between the two. I have no any vested interest in these except to help make your life a little bit easier. So think about it because it really helps stop a lot of the email trafficking that goes back and forth. Um, the other thing, which I don't have a slide on, but I will tell you is the single best thing that's happened to our residency program is the whole program has moved to Slack. So that has dropped the amount of emails and text messages that I receive by, I would be, and tell you in all honesty, 
because everything is directed through that. Residents, instead of texting me on the phone, will just message me through Slack. We get the same beep on your phone that there's an actual message, but everything is contained there. The same thing with all the emails. Uh, you know, essentially, you're posting things in all these different channels that you're able to have in Slack. So all of our conversations are occurring through there. We use one for our program leadership team, which doesn't include chiefs. Then we have a channel that includes program leadership and chiefs. Then we have a general resident channel, et cetera. The residents love it. It's extremely, you know, towards what they want to do. And we also teach off of that. We have a channel called BrainFlex. And that's actually how we communicate interesting cases, de-identifying, of course, sometimes, and um, do things through there. So I would really encourage you. It's the single best thing uh, to kind of house things in one place. So you have to realize that mistakes are going to be made, right? And that's okay because we're all human, right? So please allow room for error. Okay? And that's very key in the process. Next, don't get stuck in the weeds. A lot of times we just ingrain ourselves in things that are really not that critical. So try to keep the 30,000 foot view down on your, on yourself and your program versus actually getting stuck at the three foot level. And then, you know, with the negative people, this, you know, I, you know, it's your program versus our program, stuff like that, right? You need to motivate the minimally motivated, is what I call it. Because very frankly, I know what's wrong with my program, but I need you to help me. So try to actually, hey, you know, that person is really terrible with uh, CHF management. So are you going to be the champion and teach them things about that? You need to have faculty champions, okay? And this obviously allows you to unload some of the work, and then we can change your resident to our resident again, which I think is really important. It's okay to say I can't do it. This is incredibly difficult for any young faculty member in this room. Why? Because you're trying to plow forward and reach some of your career aspirations. But you have to be willing to say, no, and if you're really good at what you do, and I know that you're good at what you do in this room, then another opportunity will come. Hey, you know, I really can't accept that textbook chapter right now. I'm sure there'll be another opportunity that comes for you to do something different. And just tell that person, hey, you know, I'm really flattered, this is outstanding, but now's not the best time. Definitely think of me the next time that, you know, this sets sail. So it's okay, because we need to have less superhuman moments. Because superhuman moments don't come without a cost on some level. Unlike insanity. Insanity is nonsense. Like, first of all, look at all these people. They're in great shape to begin with. They don't need to lose weight, right? So set realistic goals. And for me, insanity is not realistic. Even if some of you in the room have done it. Nevertheless, I'm working on my six-pack. So, now, this other thing, which I think is a wonderful piece of advice that I've gotten along the way, is make sure you do a two-for-one. So, the most obvious thing is uh, some of you will be lecturing here, some of you lecture in your shops, all of you lecture in your shops, but some of you will get invited to do national talks. If you're doing the talk, make sure you publish. You've done so much work. It's just a matter of making, of translating slides into a manuscript. Don't just make it a one-time thing. Have a two-for-one. Same thing when you're at work. Really try to, you know, if you have to go down to work, then make sure your meetings get stacked. Having, like, the hour break in between meetings equals water cooler time, and nothing gets done because we start talking about other things. So really try to have a two-for-one and use... Some type of platform, uh, we try to, you know, use, um, like we discussed our chiefs because all of us couldn't get together our chief selection this year on a Google Hangouts. So we did it from all remote places and we still got the end product resulted. We chose our chiefs, but we didn't have to sit in a room together at work and figure this out. So use the digital platform those that, that's out there. And then when an opportunity comes, you should have three buckets. 
What's good for me and my career? And certainly, if it hits that bucket, you're going to do it. Well, good for me, but maybe not my career. So that one's a question mark. And then good for my career, but maybe not for me. You have to drop things in those three buckets and make it easier for yourself to prioritize what you should go after. And I would tell you to reach out to a ton of people. Dan, myself, Sadi is here. Tons of people who I know are here. We wouldn't be who we are without mentorship. It's that simple. And it's cord mentorship. So there is someone in this room that you can tap who's been there, done that, and been to the rodeo and can tell you how to do it easier. So don't reinvent wheels, okay? It's just not necessary. And it should make your life easier. Use your department, if nothing else. Oh, my God, how did I appear on this slide? Yes, I don't delegate. I'm terrible at it. So, again, how can I learn from this guy? Just do the opposite of me. That's it. So I don't. But here's what I want you to do with delegation. Here's the best question that I've come across to truly understand, should I farm this out or should I take hold of this? Ask this question. Where can I help? Or where am I really needed? If you answer yes to where am I really needed, you should take that on. If it's just where can I help, you're still responsible for the final outcome as the faculty member or the PD or the APD or the clerkship director, but you don't have to take that on as your project. You just have to overcome it. Does it make sense? So ask this question. Where can I help or where am I really needed? And then you've got to reward yourself. You know, all of us schedule vacation, excuse me, we schedule meetings, etc. Why not schedule the day off? Is there anything wrong with that? You'll actually realize in life that you're just not that important. I'll talk a lot about that on Friday, on uh, Saturday when I do my last talk. But I figured this out. The residency program existed before Mike. It exists with Mike, and it will exist after Mike. And when you come to that realization that the world doesn't revolve around you, then you can free yourself and actually realize, yes, I can take a day off. I can take more time for myself and prioritize other things on my list. So how do you eat an elephant, right? Or kill an elephant, or eat an elephant. What the, I don't know, whatever, it's like four o'clock. Uh, one bite at a time, is it one bite at a time? Yes, is that right? Thank you. Ah! Holy cow, I'm breaking down here. So, um, this is my last slide. Make yourself a priority because at the end of the day, you're your longest commitment. So start with you first, move to your family, then work because those, some things can be replaced, others can't. You've been fantastic. I really appreciate being here. Thank you guys for coming to the conference. You really are our future.